Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is The Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Coming up, Saskatchewan spreads COVID misinformation, CBC goes full steam ahead on climate alarmism, and one of the architects of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms shakes his head at what's become of Canada. The Andrew Lawton Show starts right now. Hello and welcome to The Andrew Lawton Show. This is Canada's most irreverent talk show, Tuesday, October 19th, 2021. One day after the great Alberta equalization referendum. And it's a lot like an American presidential election in that we still don't actually know the results. We, we have a sense of them. And, and generally speaking, it looks like anywhere from 58 to 60% of people voted in favor of taking equalization out of the Constitution. This is the uh, mechanism by which Alberta's hard-earned money goes to provinces that are not as wealthy like Atlantic Canada and notably Quebec. Here's the thing, though. It's non-binding. We've talked about this on the show in the past. The federal government doesn't look at the referendum and say, oh, well, okay, you Albertans voted. I guess the Constitution changes. No, there still is this very complex and convoluted formula. But what those pursuing this referendum have been banking on is that the federal government will have a moral and political and legal duty to negotiate in good faith with the province. This is a, a duty that people think comes from a Supreme Court decision about a Quebec secession referendum, that if, if people in a province are, are that concerned about something, that they vote in favor of it in a referendum, and it has to do with independence, the federal government has to play ball. So I, I am not ignoring this. We actually did at True North a live broadcast delving into this and covering the results in real time as they were coming in last night. The nature of this thing, however, is that the provincial results that come from all municipalities, because it was the communities that were running this, are not going to become available for another week. So we'll have a lot more to break down once we get the full numbers. But suffice it to say, it looks like Albertans had their say and are clearly dissatisfied with the status quo as far as equalization. And I know that a big part of the question now will be, how much can we extrapolate from that? Is this just Albertans looking and saying, yeah, I don't like how much money goes to Quebec, or is it a broader discontent with Confederation, which I think it probably is. I, I think it probably is from a lot of the people I've spoken to. So that's something we'll be paying close attention to in the days, weeks, and let's be real, probably months and years to come. I want to move a province east, though, and talk about Saskatchewan for a couple of moments. A couple of standout examples of COVID lunacy in Saskatchewan, which is, by the way, a lovely province. I've been there on a few occasions and have never had a bad experience there. The Saskatchewan Health Authority posted on Twitter yesterday in a, an effort to get young people vaccinated because the Canadian government had posted this thing saying, I'm young and healthy, should I still get COVID? And they say, yeah, we should definitely have you get vaccinated no matter how young and spry and vibrant you are. No one says spry when you're talking about young people. Anyway, I guess I just did. And then the Saskatchewan Health Authority retweeted it and says, your risk from COVID-19 is not determined by age, fitness level, or community. Your risk is determined by vaccine status. 78% of all new cases and hospitalizations in Saskatchewan in September were unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people. So I don't want to do the whole Zapruder film here and like just go like frame by frame or in this case word by word and, and break this down to the point where you just have no tolerance to look at a tweet or look at anything from the province of Saskatchewan ever again. But I do want to parse this a little bit because they say in no uncertain terms, your risk from COVID is not determined by age, fitness level or community. We know this is absolutely untrue. Age has a very, very key bearing on how sick you're likely to get, especially when it comes down to your general health, which is definitely connected to fitness level. So a young, vibrant, active, fit 20-something is at significantly lower risk than an unfit older person with comorbidities galore. This is, I mean, this is one of the first things we learned about COVID before a lot of the other things is that it was disproportionately affecting the elderly because they have weakened immune systems because they're more likely to have comorbidities and, and so on. Now, this is not saying that young people shouldn't get vaccinated. 
I'm a firm believer in people doing whatever they want, protecting themselves. And let's be real, a lot of young people are going to look at vaccine passports in provinces like Alberta, Saskatchewan, and elsewhere and say, well, this is the only way I can do all the social things I want to do. So th this is not about uh, telling people what they should or shouldn't do. It's simply saying that if you're going to have this discussion, let's at least have it honestly. What Saskatchewan is doing is blatantly and brazenly lying about COVID risks as they work to bump up their vaccine uptake, specifically in that younger demographic. And that PHAC line is not saying it. They're saying that the COVID vaccine helps you, uh, helps protect you from getting sick, even if you're young, healthy, and fit. The vaccine will give your body a layer of protection that it didn't have. Now, that at least is an honest thing. If you, if you believe the vaccine is protecting you and making you less symptomatic and less likely to get sick, that's true whether you're young, healthy, or older and unhealthy, or for that matter, younger and unhealthy. But I mean, we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But the Saskatchewan line here, that nothing has any bearing on how sick you're going to get, except whether you're vaccinated or not. And, and the tweet itself tends to undermine that point because there still are, as they say here, 22% of these cases and hospitalizations that do not fit into that category. And by the way, they're lumping in this cases and hospitalizations in September. Cases and hospitalizations are very different things. Cases matter less and less when you're talking about populations that are not getting sick, that are not going into the ICU, that are not experiencing major symptoms, if you have COVID and it to you feels like you've got the sniffles or a sore throat, I wouldn't consider that case a sign of anything all that bad. I mean, in a lot of cases, and look, I, I know people have very different beliefs on, on the efficacy of the vaccine. I'm vaccinated. The reason I got vaccinated is because I was confident that if I was going to get it, I wanted to reduce the burden that I would face as far as symptoms go. And that was a decision that I made. You can make your own decisions, but I, I'm not arguing the science here. I, I'm simply pointing out that all the things we know about this are being completely ripped up when Saskatchewan is using such disingenuous language to promote vaccination. And, and very critical in the question of choice is informed consent. And you become less and less informed when this is what passes for the government messaging surrounding COVID, when the government is lying blatantly lying or or just to give them benefit of the doubt is so woefully incompetent they can't clearly communicate something so whether they want to blame it on malice or incompetence i'll leave up to them but i think this is fairly dishonest uh, and and it becomes more and more difficult for anyone to know what to believe or to trust the so-called official public health experts when they're saying that, yeah, your age, your health, your fitness level have no bearing. I mean, remember how Alberta just had to walk back them claiming that a 14-year-old boy had died of COVID when in actuality, as confirmed by his own sister, he died of brain cancer and just happened to test positive for COVID as he was on his deathbed. That doesn't make the death any less tragic. And the fact that this was a politicized passing was quite shameful because this family was grieving and all of a sudden they were forced to engage in what was really a political debate because the only reason you would count a case like that as a COVID case is if you're trying to inadvertently or intentionally boost your numbers or if you just don't care about the distinction. But even then, you have to ask the question of why do these governments not care? Why do they not care about getting it right? Because anytime governments point to someone who is in that demographic you don't expect to die of COVID, anytime they point to someone there, it's meant to be jarring. It's meant to be jarring. It's meant to make people think, oh, well, I mean, yeah, if it, no, if it happened to a 14-year-old boy, may, maybe I was wrong to think that this is a disease that only helps certain people. But the whole thing is that, as Ben Shapiro says, facts don't care about your feelings. Your political agenda, your narrative, the direction you want to take these things, it is completely disconnected from the facts and the science on which we're supposed to be relying when it comes to understanding what's happening in the course of this pandemic. And we don't get to concoct a risk that by and large isn't there for certain demographics and certain populations just because we want to achieve this public health priority that the government has set out of 100% vaccine uptake and zero cases. We're never going to get to zero cases. Anyone who builds a policy around that is just so woefully mistaken that it is even possible. 
But this is coming from Saskatchewan, which, by the way, is not a standout example of how to handle this. Just on Thursday, and I, I didn't see it until Saturday, the Saskatchewan police published, I'm not going to show them here because I don't want to contribute to this, but they showed 15 pictures of people that looked like they were screenshots from live streams or, uh, you know, they've zoomed into the background of a photo that someone posted on social media or whatever it was. But 15 people who are wanted in connection with a public health investigation that the Saskatchewan Police Service is undertaking. And that investigation is into people that supposedly violated public health orders at Maxime Bernier's and the People's Party of Canada's Victory Night Party in Saskatoon or Election Night Party in Saskatoon on September 20th. They, they call them victory parties, even if you, uh, you lose the election, which is what happened with the PPC. But <laughs> the reality is the the PPC people, these supporters, are now being sought out by the police, which who want to identify them to, I don't know, serve them with a ticket for not wearing a mask or not social distancing. I don't know. It doesn't say what the offense is. But I want to go into this police release from Saskatoon here. They say that the public health enforcement oftentimes is conducted after the fact. This is, I think, quite fascinating. Enforcement is not always visible and largely occurs after the incident. In this case, the investigation into the event of September 20th has at this time required more than 160 hours of investigative time. 160 hours. Now, I, I said in my column on this, I don't know if we're talking about one guy that was working around the clocks in September 20th, or maybe 160 officers that each just put in an hour. Who knows what the breakdown is? But 160 investigative hours of well-paid police officers to try to track down a handful of unmasked PPC supporters from an event a couple of weeks ago that has had no issues attached to it, so far as I can tell. So is this really the best use of time? Is the pandemic that under control that we can just start going after people at an election night party? Is there that little crime in Saskatoon or in Saskatchewan that this is where we're devoting our law enforcement efforts? Now, one of the issues here is that oftentimes these are, are not individual. In fact, I'd say usually they aren't individual police officers that decide they want to be vindictive about these people. Throughout the lockdown, I've heard from a great many police officers that want nothing to do with the heavy-handed enforcement that's being foisted upon them by the government and by some of the overseers of police. I actually heard from a couple of Saskatoon, specifically Saskatoon police officers that have said, yeah, we, we want nothing to do with this. And one of them said that uh, they're actually embarrassed. Their colleagues and them are embarrassed that this is what the police service has decided as an organization to do. So all of this is to say, I, I'm not blaming individual police officers. In fact, if I were one of the officers there, I'd hope that at the end of it, they say, oh yeah, you know what? We looked hard. These 15 people, they're just ghosts in the wind. We have no idea who they are. We'll never track them down. This is going to be an unsolved crime. We'll put it on the cold case. And you know, 40 years later, when some investigator is flipping through the cold cases, they'll see unsolved murder, unsolved rape, uh, serial killer. Uh, oh, who are these 15 people at that PPC part? Well, you know, let's track them down now. And it will become a great story. Story. They'll make a uh, CBC feature on it someday. But the reality is this is now what policing is about. And they say there's a backlog. They do this all after the fact. It's not even about preventing these issues from taking place in the moment. It's about going after the fact and punitively trying to hunt people down that might have been unmasked in public. This, this is aligning with what I shared last week about the uh, COVID snitch portals that Saskatchewan and Manitoba and some other provinces have. I think Quebec as well. This is what it's now come down to. So uh, no surprise that Saskatchewan is telling people no matter what, no matter who you are, your health, your age, none of that matters. You're, you're going to get sick and you're going to end up in the hospital. And they're also the same people that are trying to uh, hunt down the unmasked and using 160 police hours, 160 investigative hours to do it. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show. Coming up in just a couple of weeks is this massive conference in Glasgow, Scotland, in the United Kingdom 
on climate change. It's the sequel to the Paris Conference, COP26, the big climate conference that uh, all of these people around the world, including from Canada, are proving how much they want to rein in carbon emissions that they all fly to one place and have a big old party and talk for weeks and weeks and weeks about all these things they should do that don't really affect them with their private jets and government entourages, but affect the rest of us who have to pay carbon taxes and are told to live without X, Y, and Z. Well, 30,000 of them going to be in Glasgow, and this is something that we were actually at True North hoping to cover. And oddly, the United Nations, who puts on this conference, wasn't too keen on having independent journalists there. So we'll be covering it from afar with whatever we are able to pull out of this conference. But CBC was able to get full access. CBC is sending a whole team to Glasgow to cover this. And I wanted to share with you on the eve of this summit, a post that was published on CBC's news website by its editor-in-chief, Brody Fenlon, about how CBC is going all in on climate change, not just throughout Glasgow, but in general in its coverage. The article is titled, The Planet is Changing, So Will Our Journalism. The subtitle, CBC News Commits to Doing Even More Climate Change Journalism. Now, climate change journalism is this emerging field. You have many media outlets, including in Canada, that get grant money, a big box enterprise, to hire reporters just to focus on climate change. A lot of these are activists. They are reporting on this through the lens that they've already really decided what the story is. And ultimately, these are the types of journalists that we're going to see in this program. Now, CBC says, yeah, climate change is not just about the environment. It's about health, the economy, jobs, energy, food, water, security, geopolitics, justice, and equity. No sector will be spared its impact. Climate change will define every aspect of our lives and those of generations to come. This is not a neutral objective approach to climate change. What they're saying there is the alarmist position. That's a very subjective position. You can say it's an important political issue. You can say it, it's broader than just the environment, sure. But what they're saying there is that they're going whole hog into the alarmist narrative, that this is this growing and existential threat that will kill us all if it's not reined in. And the article goes on. We commit to doing even more, Brody Fenlon writes. They're going to launch a new banner called Our Changing Planet. They're going to make climate change a significant focus of journalism and a priority area across newsrooms, programs, and digital platforms before and after COP26. They've designated climate as a national beat. They're having a new climate editor, and they're also going to have a new international climate reporting team. Now, let's just hear how they're planning on covering COP26. They're going to send a London correspondent. They're going to send another London correspondent. They're going to send someone to Calgary to talk about Canada's, quote, deep attachment to and dependence on oil and gas production. Does that not sound like they're trying to write about that as though it's a problem? that they're taking aim at Canada's resource richness and the fact that resources are a key part of the Canadian economy. That's how I take that. I mean, obviously, I'll keep an open mind. I'll follow that coverage. But it sounds like Canada and Alberta are the bad guys in this coverage plan. They're also sending a senior meteorologist to Glasgow to report on the science behind the headlines. They're going to experiment with carbon offsets and credits related to news gathering travel. So all of this travel of sending international producers and videographers and reporters around, yeah, that emits a carbon footprint. So CBC is going to supposedly offset that footprint by spending your money, because that's what CBC is, an exercise in government subsidy, your money to plant trees somewhere so that they feel less guilty about traveling to pursue the coverage that they've decided is important. Okay, I'm dizzy just from describing that. But that's basically what's happening here. So that $1.3 billion CBC gets, they're going to have within that a carbon offset budget so that they can justify sending dozens of people around the world to India, Iceland, Glasgow, Alberta, all to tell us that we need to travel less and do more to fight climate change. Okay. Speaking of India, they've established an India Bureau and their correspondent there, Salima Shivji, is going to do a special report on the raging debate over coal. 
So again, we're now going to lecture India about the, how they have to do their environmental and energy policy because we've apparently decided to take aim at Indian coal production. And just to top it off, Adrian Arsenault is flying up to Canada's north where residents are adjusting to change and offer lessons for the rest of the country. So this isn't just a neutral assessment of what's happening. CBC is going to bring us lessons Lessons for the rest of the country from the North. So we're going to get a little talking to and finger wagging from the state broadcaster here on climate change. Now, now this goes on and on and on. And, and they're saying, yeah, we're still covering other things. We're still covering systemic racism, equity, truth and reconciliation. Oh, good. We can't let those go by the wayside because we're talking about climate change and whatnot. But CBC is committing to activism. CBC, the state broadcaster, is committing to climate activism, and this will only benefit certain types of politicians for whom these are issues that they very much claim in their wheelhouse. Our planet is changing, so will our journalism, Mr. Fenlon writes. Yeah, no doubt about that. We've got to take a break. When we come back, more of The Andrew Lawton Show. Stay tuned. You're tuned in to The Andrew Lawton Show. Welcome back to The Andrew Lawton Show, Canada's most irreverent talk show here on Drew North. We've talked a lot for months and months, coming up on two years now, about our civil liberties in Canada being under attack from the government. And, and in fact, that's the very idea of the liberal democratic thesis, if you're a, a political theorist, that the best application of our rights is to be left alone by government, that government is the greatest threat to your ability to pursue whatever it is you want to pursue as an individual. And this idea was captured in Canada nearly 40 years ago by the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Now, I would say it's not a perfect document because we have so many applications of it in court decisions and even from politicians that I'd say do not reflect what the intended rights of the Charter were supposed to be. But nevertheless, it is part of the Canadian Constitution that we have the right to freedom of expression, we have the right to mobility, we have the right to life, to liberty, to security, to all of these things that we should be celebrating and upholding. But governments don't seem to want to do that. Charter rights have been under attack for a year and a half and many other fora as well, but certainly throughout the course of the pandemic. And in particular with this latest vaccine mandate, if you want to get on a plane to fly out of the country as one example. Let's go back to the basics here. I want to talk to someone who was there at the very beginning when he was the premier of Newfoundland and Labrador when the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was being drafted, the last surviving of the premiers involved in that very significant process in Canadian history. That is former Newfoundland Premier Brian Peckford, who joins me now. Brian, it's wonderful to talk to you. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm more than pleased to help clarify the whole business about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is something that, again, we're coming up on the, the 40th anniversary of, and I think we'll have to have you back around then to talk about uh, the legacy of the Charter. But the one fundamental thing that people have viewed in the Charter all throughout its history is that it's there to protect the rights of Canadians. And we have in that freedom of expression, mobility, all of these things have been under an increasing threat from government in the last year and a half. And, and when you see the Charter that you left behind as part of your political political legacy and you see what's been happening how do you reconcile those two visions can't i can't reconcile those two visions and i'm sure that if any of the other first ministers were still alive uh, they would uh, voice the same kind of shock and surprise as i do to see how uh, callously the governments not individuals or organizations or somebody who's trying to undermine our society or some anarchist somewhere but the actual um, governments uh, whose predecessors participated in forming and creating this Charter of Rights and Freedoms in the Constitution Act of 1982. So I am absolutely shocked and have been writing about it extensively uh, for the last couple of years, highlighting the fact that what the governments are doing violates, you know, at least four different sections of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 2, Section 6, Section 7, and Section 15, all of which deal with freedoms and rights, equality rights, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom to move around the country, freedom to have a job. 
a right. It's a right to have a job. Your rights are supposed to be protected, and yet jobs are being taken away from people. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and um, governments are doing this willy nilly. The parliaments are not involved anymore. This is the other part of the equation that a lot of people are forgetting. I thought this was a parliamentary democracy. Parliamentary democracy means by its very definition, you go through the parliament for all these things. So it seems to me that the parliament of Canada and the parliaments of all of the other jurisdictions, by the way, there are 14 parliaments in Canada, when you include the territories, the three territories, 10 provinces and the federal government. These should be open and these should be debating the provisions that the government is suggesting should be brought in to mitigate the virus called the COVID-19. And there should be a full and healthy debate by the representatives of the people. So not only is the Charter of Rights being violated, but the whole custom convention uh, and parliamentary democracy principles are being, what shall I, violated and abused. Uh, in what is now happening and what has been happening for the last almost two years now. There's a tremendous backlog in the courts of, of challenges of everything ranging from individual fines that people have received under lockdown measures to very large programs like hotel quarantine, vaccine mandates, all of this. But but in the cases that have been litigated, courts have, generally speaking, taken a, taken a very wide interpretation of the very first section of the Charter, which is very familiar certainly to you and, and to a lot of Canadians by now, that says that all of the other rights you have can be limited by government and I, I knew that and by the courts and I, I know that you wrote a letter to premiers about this and you you basically said you know section one is not protecting you as much as you think it is section one says that the federal government or the provinces have to demonstrably justify what they are doing within reasonable limits in a free and democratic society by law they have not demonstrably justified what they are doing. And therefore, in my view, everybody else is being silent on this. Everybody else is being, I haven't heard any law societies. I haven't heard any, any law professors or political science people. Everybody's going silent. There's a sort of a collective psychosis or amnesia in the country where nobody wants to speak up on this. They have not demonstrably justified. I mean, I can read the words. I don't have to be a constitutional lawyer. I was involved in the constitution making. And so I have a fair amount of experience uh, in that over like almost two years when we were negotiating the Constitution Act. So I do have some experience. I do have some knowledge of words and what is put in a constitution. And I've been studying this ever since it was created back in 1981. So I feel I have some authority on this. And, and therefore, I know what ju demonstrably justify means. You have to justify demonstrably. In other words, you have to be quite open and transparent and you have to make, you have to have great evidence. And what the governments have not done is that they have not allowed through their parliaments or through any hearings, competing views on the medical science that is driving these lockdowns and these mandates and so on. And the mere fact that they have, and that means they have not demonstrably justified the positions they are taking. So in my view, if this ever gets to the Supreme Court of Canada, if there's any independence left at all in the judiciary, and that's where it would reside right now, I, I submit, then it seems to me they would have to rule a lot of these measures to be unconstitutional. Now, they may put in place other measures or say you can do A and you can do B, but you can't do C and D, or we'll put a time frame on this, or you give me more evidence before I make a final decision, right? They could do all of those things, but... They, and the other thing I've said to the premiers in an in a, in a open letter is there is a measure to expedite this through the courts. Nobody's talking about this either. And that is provincial or federal reference. Every government of Canada, provinces and the federal government can take their measures and refer directly to their highest court. In the case of the provinces, it's their appeal court. In the case of the federal government, it's the Supreme Court of Canada. And they could ask those courts, is what we are doing following the constitution of this country? Is it following the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Not one has done it. I've submitted an open letter to all premiers asking them, why won't you refer what you're doing to your courts to get a decision so that the people of Canada know you're being constitutional?
Not one premier has answered me. Not one premier has answered me. And I find that shocking, that not even the courtesy to respond to somebody who was involved in the Constitution in the beginning, especially the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So there are measures available. A lot of people are frustrated. But if, the, if a province of Canada did what I'm saying and referred this to their appeal court, do you think the appeal court would sit on that? Not on your life. They would know right away as a signal by these governments, they want to know, you know whether we're constitutional. They would take that up immediately make an adjudication, then that province could refer directly to the Supreme Court of Canada. It can go directly to the Supreme Court of Canada. So those two courts could, within six months, just say, give it an outside of a year, make a decision. Not the three or four years that we're into now with them going through the courts by organizations and individuals and so on, because in the regular course of business, it has to go uh, to the... Uh, trial division of the Supreme Court of a province, then to the appeal division of the Supreme Court of the province, then to the Supreme Court of Canada. So that can be shortened immeasurably, especially if a government initiated it, because then the courts would be seized with knowing they need a quick decision. I don't disagree with you, but I think the two issues there are, are firstly that a lot of provinces know that what they're doing is, is not constitutional and they don't want to put it through that scrutiny. But also, I, I have a, a not a lot of optimism that the courts are going to be on the right side of this. And, and to go back to Section 1 for a moment, we've seen in a number of, of constitutional uh, uh, charter litigation cases and, and you know even more recently on some of the, the COVID lockdown-related litigation that, that, again, courts are taking government at its word that COVID is kind of a trump card that you can use to suspend civil liberties. They're not worried about the inherent constraints of, of Section 1. So uh, the general question, I, I guess I'll put to you, Brian, is, is when that was being drafted and when that was being considered, was there a, a little bit more optimism about how the judiciary would use that power? No question. Nobody, nobody. And I would say those people who are still alive, who were deputy ministers, uh, advisors to the various governments, there's quite a few of them still alive, should be coming out and saying what I'm saying. I don't think there was anybody in that room at the time or in the various rooms of the various delegations who thought that this would happen at this point in time, even, even in the public uh, uh, emergency, so-called, so-called. The Alberta so, so Section 1 was never meant to be a trump card for what we're seeing now. Well, but it's a protection because it's demands to be justified and they haven't done that. They're using that, but it cannot be... That's not a valid use of that section. So they're still violating the constitution. So that's how I would, that's how I interpret it. Yes, they might try to use it as a Trump card, but it's a false Trump card. It's a false Trump card because where is the justification demonstrably made? Nowhere. All they've done is gone ahead with their provisions with no justification in those provisions what they did. And by the way, in Alberta, there's a court case by the Center of Constitutional Freedoms and they've been trying to get the evidence from the Alberta government. And the Alberta government has been refraining from providing mm -hmm. the evidence, the evidence, by the way, that they were supposed to have for the decisions they made a year and a half ago. So to say they don't have it, or it's gonna take us time to prepare it is absolutely specious and doesn't pass muster. So that's a good ex example of one government that's very afraid to come forward with the evidence. Evidence has not been presented to justify what the governments are doing. And they have that obligation under Section 1 to do so. You've been a premier. You understand the political implications of your actions. And you also understand, of course, working within the bureaucracy and having some forces in government and in deputy ministers that want to push and pull you every which way. But a lot of these premiers, you know, it seems like they're listening to the public health experts that they cite. And, and a lot of them are, are only interested in lockdowns. They're not interested in exploring the economic implications, the civil liberties implications, and all of these other things. And, and I guess I, I'm just curious why you think a lot of these premiers ha have narrowed their focus so much to only really pull advice from one source and one source only as they're drafting these measures. I find it uh, very disturbing. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the answers is, is very poor leadership in this country right now. Uh, obviously, L leaders are to take advice, but after taking advice, then they're to go away and make up their own minds, both the cabinet and the ministers and the premier or prime minister. That doesn't look like it's happening now. But it's, it's blatant, Andrew. I mean, there's the Great Barrington Declaration. How long has that been out there? And they tried to malign the three 
greatest experts in the world who signed that Barrington Declaration saying that these lockdowns are not going to work. And, you know, some of tens of thousands of doctors and, and research scientists around the world. That's com being completely ignored. So it's not only on the, you know, the narrow scale, but on the broader scale. They're not even taking that into consideration. So once again, I come back to number one is a lack of leadership. There's no question about it that most of the leaders of this, this country today have failed the test of leadership, have failed the test of their premiership, have failed the test of their prime ministership. And it comes down now, unfortunately, to civil society. It comes down to you and me and others. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to articulate an alternative view, not to be against vaccines, generally speaking, but be against one that has not proven its worth in any testing because it's still experimental and is damaging tens of killing tens of thousands of people, according to the government records themselves, both in the United States and Europe. And, and therefore, we should be far more cautious and we should be taking a broader view of, of the guidance and, ex, and, and expertise that we're supposed to do as good leaders. And we're not doing that. And so I think that there's a failure of leadership, number one, but there's also a failure by civic society, by civil society, by our business leaders, by our union leaders, by our academic leaders uh, to, to come forward. And the other problem with that is our democracy has been failing for quite some time. This is a catalyst that sort of our man manifests it more open so more people see it, okay? It's been failing for a long while, especially since Pierre Elliott Trudeau Sr., when he started to develop a bigger prime minister's office. The power has been moving from the MPs. The power has been moving from the parliament. Power went first of all to the cabinet with the prime minister. Now it's gone all the way to the prime minister. And there's a book out that people should read by Donald Savoy entitled Democracy in Canada, the Disintegration of Our Institutions. And he tracks, he tracks this, this evolution of the diminution of power from the parliament uh, to the prime minister's office over time. And so we have been gradually losing our democracy and this so-called pandemic, this virus has manifested all of the scars that we allowed to happen over the last three or four decades, sadly. And so there's a real leadership vacuum, not only at the political level, but at the academic business and union level. In other words, our civic society is broken. And we need to fix it soon in order to get back the democracy that we're losing now every day. Just to, as we close here, and you look back, as I mentioned, on, on almost 40 years of, of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and, and still a country that has devolved into the things you and I have been chatting about for uh, the time we've been, we've been uh, discussing things. Do you feel that the Charter is still the tool it was intended to be? Or, or do you feel looking back like there was something missing from it? No, I don't think there's anything missing from it. All of the elements are there. Remember, we had the Bill of Rights before the Charter. John Diefenbaker introduced the yes. Bill of Rights. So we well, we had... still do, technically. Well, it is as a federal law, but the whole idea of the Charter was to put it in the Constitution so it would be further away from being, being able to be changed. <laughs> that was the whole idea. We already had a Charter. All the ideas that are in the Charter were in the Bill of Rights that Mr. Diefenbaker passed, but it was a federal act of the Parliament and therefore mm -hmm. was subject to change by any majority of government that came in. Could be changed very easily. But by putting it in the Constitution, we all thought, everybody thought, that therefore it's very difficult to change now and therefore we have our rights and freedoms protected, only to find out today that we don't. Well, on that grim note, I, I guess it shows that, uh, as you mentioned, we have to, in civil society, be the ones to stand up for our freedoms first and foremost. Former Newfoundland Premier Brian Peckford, thank you so much, sir, for joining me. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Andrew, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much. That was former Newfoundland Premier Brian Peckford. I, that's it for me. I can't add anything after that discussion, nor would I even want to. We'll definitely have to get him back on the show, certainly for the 40th anniversary of the Charter, but I'd say even before then as well. That was fantastic. We have to end things here. My thanks to all of you for tuning in to Canada's most irreverent talk show. You're listening to The Andrew Lawton Show here on True North. Thank you, God bless, and good day. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.